morning, everybody. My name's Ruth Haynes, and I'm chairing and uh, doing some of the presentation um, tonight on this lecture. Okay, so th this is me. Um, at the bottom of this slide is a link if you wanted to purchase the book. Now, the book took me, when I did my final read through, it took 18 hours to read. So to, to fit the subject into 45 minutes is going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, so if this seems to be a bit of a race and a simplistic view of robustness and disproportionate collapse, um, I would be happy to talk about it for 18 hours, but that's not tonight's uh, option. Okay, so let's talk about the background to the second edition. So prior to being involved with writing the book, I did four years of teaching at the institution um, on the subject of robustness and disproportionate collapse. And it was a very popular and well attended course. And I don't think this has anything to do with me. I think this was to do with the fact there's quite a lot of uncertainty about the subject. The engineers attending were well motivated, were motivated and clever engineers with supportive companies. Um, and yet people came with a lot of questions. I also myself had a very early experience of designing a vertical extension, and I relied on the first edition hugely. It was effectively my Bible. Um, in fact, I think I have actually read the whole of the first edition, whereas I've never read the whole of the Bible, obviously. Only a handful of people have. Um, and the book was, was very invaluable to me, um, and I was just very fond of it. And um, it was a great piece of work by Alan Mann, the original author. And after about 20 years of design via working um, in warranty for a bit, I ended up in building control, um, which is a lot more interesting than people have ever think because we see everything. And what I have, have realized is that um, robustness is often not considered in building design, which might just about be okay with smaller projects, but, but really isn't as you, as you get bigger. And then there's a huge confusion just over the basics, the tie forces. Um, and I felt there was an opportunity in the second edition to sort out some of these aspects of confusion. So for a start, the, 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 the first edition is from 2010. So there's still a lot of reference to British standards. So I wanted the second edition to be Eurocode centric. I thought it'd be a good idea to include some worked examples, for example, on tie forces, and those of um, the contributors to the book who 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 did some work on the calculations uh, have realised that it's actually sometimes quite difficult to get those tie forces right, um, even though it's actually simple addition and uh, multiplication. I wanted there to be no confusion as to where to turn for the relevant expressions in the Eurocodes. Um, I think because the Eurocodes stylistically are quite challenging to read, there seems to sometimes be a bit of a reluctance to actually read what a Eurocode says. And then I wanted to use CROSS um, as a resource to, to look at those examples of building collapse so, so that as engineers, our design can be informed. And then this existing building stuff, especially vertical extensions, uh, it, I was keen to have a big section about existing buildings uh, and Sean majorly contributed to that, that that chapter of the book. And then also some straightforward links to further information. Um, I haven't got an academic background other than going to university and I slightly struggle with technical books and all the references. And so I was very keen that we drew attention to key reading material. And I was helped hugely in this um, by, by Gillian, who um, edited and typeset the book. And within the book, we have signposted links to things that I think are really good, good reads. OK, so I'm going to start with the basics. What is disproportionate collapse and what is proportionate collapse? So proportionate collapse, an incident or an accident occurs and there's none or there's limited building collapse. And approved document A, uh, diagram 24, tells us what kind of collapse we could potentially accept. 
15 percent or 100 square meters. This is slightly different um, to what it was about a decade ago, where the area limit, I think, was 75 square meters. And then what is disproportionate collapse? Well, you have an incident or an accident and the collapse is extensive and it's completely out of proportion to the original incident. And I once had a lay client say to me, it's like moving a picture and the whole wall collapses. But BSEN 1991-17 gives us a great illustration of disproportionate collapse. So when I think of the effort we went to to get decent illustrations in the book, um, I feel that uh, the Eurocode people didn't possibly go to quite the same effort. But I think equally, though this isn't the best drawing in, in the world, it does perfectly illustrate a disproportionate collapse. So in, in the UK, the history of looking at robustness and disproportionate collapse stems from Ronan Point in 1968. It's a building we're very familiar with. We see photos of it a lot. And th this is one of the, the, the details um, at the floor and wall junction, but the floor and wall, as we know now, were not adequately tied together. And what happened at Ronan Point was Mrs Ivy Hodge decided to make a cup of tea. And when she lit her match to light her gas stove, a gas explosion, there was a gas explosion, it blew out some of the external walls and there was the, the walls um, these corner walls all piled on top of each other um, and the whole of the corner of the building came off and fell to the ground. It was a significant accident um, but Mrs Ivy Hodge herself was absolutely fine and she actually took her gas cooker to her next home which shows that she had a lot of faith in her gas cooker. But the more serious point is that this gas explosion wasn't significant enough to actually injure her but it caused a huge amount of uh, damage to the building. So why was this collapse disproportionate? Well, it was disproportionate because she survived, uh, indicating the gas explosion was quite small, but the building substantially collapsed at the corner. And the significance of Ronan Point is that we had the first major changes in building regulations. Um, with the first being the Fifth Amendment in 1970. And there's, uh, time has passed and, and rules have, have changed since um, or enhanced. Uh, disproportionate collapse is embodied in Part A of the building regulations in Approved Document A. So if you were to look at Approved Document A, we would see A3, which is from Schedule 1 of the building regulations, where it tells us that buildings should be constructed so that in the event of an accident, the building will not suffer collapse to an extent disproportionate to the cause. And that's all we're expected to do. So theoretically, it's all quite simple. OK, so what has happened since Ronan Point? Well, I'm, I'm not going to go through these slides, but this might give you a clue to what's coming next. And Alistair is going to be talking about uh, a significant accident amongst other things uh, that these slides refer to. So we seem to have had quite a lot of bad luck with, well I wouldn't say it's luck, um, I'm not really fatalistic like that, we, we seem to have had misfortune due to possibly poor engineering or poor construction or age over the last few years and in, in December 2021 Cross sent out a structural alert which stated the following, Structural and civil and fire engineers work in a high-risk environment. Most of the time, all is well, but when a problem occurs, it can be very serious, both in terms of life, commercial cost and reputation. I think it's important to remember that as engineers, we're in, although we sometimes feel like a hidden profession, actually the work we do is utterly important. People expect to be safe in their homes, whether their home is a single storey, two storey house or um, a block of flats. It is our moral duty to do the right thing as engineers. So what we can conclude from Ronan Point and what's happened since is that buildings collapse and they're often initiated by a combination of factors and Alistair will come on to talk about this. Like I say, though we're a hidden profession, we are the people who protect the public. And of course, one of the biggest disasters we've had in recent years is Grenfell, which is an utter tragedy. 
But a building that will not collapse disproportionately is a robust building. So what makes a robust building? Well, in the book, this is explored a lot more thoroughly. But a very brief summary for now is, if a, is simplicity. If a building is relatively simple, it's more likely to be robust. So if as a design engineer, we can't get vertical and horizontal load transfer to work particularly easily, we're more likely to make a, a building robust. Um, we're less likely to make a building robust. And if the structural scheme is convoluted, we might struggle more to make the building robust. So I think simplicity of a building structure is absolutely key. And where we don't have simplicity, we need to think really hard about how the building might fail if there were to be an accidental event. So certain kinds of structure are very are more vulnerable than others. So transfer beams in, in buildings or significant cantilevers or particularly long span beams uh, make a building more vulnerable. But these can often be key structural elements. So we have to have think of a way of, of dealing with these more vulnerable elements. Whereas a robust building might be one with a cellular form or a repeating grid of columns or and one which doesn't have hazards near key structural elements. And that's important to remember, is that one of the starting points in designing a robust building is to understand what the potential hazards are and if possible to remove those hazards. So in designing a robust building, we need to keep on referring back to the key design codes because all the information is actually in there. So we have British uh, BSEN 1991-17, this is the key Eurocode for designing to prevent disproportionate collapse. For concrete design, we have Eurocode 2. Now, the Eurocode 2 contains a specific formulae for checking horizontal and vertical tie forces, and these are actually differ from BSEN 1991-17. Um, these values roughly align with the old British standard, but you do need to be aware um, and this is something that um, you're very welcome to ask questions about at the end. Conversely, though, the steel code doesn't actually contain any specific requirements for robustness. And so you have to go back to BS EN 1991-17 for calculations of the tie forces. Though I've said that, that it's the only um, source, um, things like holding down precast units to steel frame, um, there's, there's a lot of information from the SCI that, that it's worth looking for. And again, we, we reference that more thoroughly in within the book. Um, the Masonry Code, Eurocode 6, there's nothing about disproportionate collapse. So you need to look at the um, PD6697, which is loosely based on the old Masonry Code. Now, of course, we're actually, um, as we speak, Eurocodes are being um, reissued. So... Um, just to point out that we're referring to the Eurocodes that are currently current as opposed to um, the the when they've all been released and we should be working with them together, I think in uh, 2028, I think is the date. Okay, timber, again, you need to have the Eurocode, but also PD6693. And there are specific requirements for timber frame and actually also some specific requirements for light steel frame to reflect their lighter weight. And then importantly, you need to have BSEN 1990 on hand. And these two expressions um, and tables are key. They set out the um, load combinations for accidental loads and they also give us the partial load factors for these load combinations. And then, of course, approved document A. Um, approved document A is our guidance on how to design a building compliant with the building regulations, and it requotes the um, the statute from Schedule One. So, the starting point of um, of designing a building to be robust is to classify it by identifying building use and its size and story, um, number of stories, basements, etc. You're probably familiar with the consequence classes um, as, as you move up from CC1A to CC3. Um, there's a, a bigger uh, 
task for the for the design engineer when it comes to designing a robust building. Consequence class 2B is the one where we get more challenged because um, especially when it's a timber or masonry building, because consequence class 2B is when vertical ties are introduced. I mean, there's nothing to stop people putting vertical ties into CC1A and CC2A buildings, um, but it's when we get to a masonry or timber building and we're, we're wondering about how to get those ties in that we, we uh, get more challenged. The, the guidance um, published uh, just under two weeks ago doesn't actually cover class consequence class three buildings, but some of the principles about looking at a CC3 building, uh, e.g. doing a risk assessment to check against um, disproportionate collapse are relevant to all buildings of all sizes. And that process is particularly useful when looking at existing buildings. Now, of course, nothing's ever straightforward. You then have to make an intelligent decision as to whether you class a basement or a mezzanine or a gallery or part floor as a story height. And each building needs to be looked at on its own merits. Um, just one thing to point out that, of course, higher risk buildings, as defined by the Building Safety Act, also come with a certain story criteria and use criteria, e.g. residential two units. But um, that seven stories, two unit thing doesn't quite match with building consequence classes uh, for designing for robustness. OK, so this table 11 is straight from approved document A. And um, just to point out one slight difference, um, that re uh, retail premises have a different area limit in approved document A and in BS EN 1991-17. And as I said before, it's the 2B group where things can sometimes get a bit challenging for timber and masonry design. And class consequence class 2B includes things like five-storey residential, four-storey retail, five-storey offices, or two-storey educational buildings. This two-storey educational building catches a lot of people out. So I work in building control and I see a lot of engineers designs and I rarely get told that an educational building of two stories is consequence class 2B. Okay, so let's look at, think about accidental design situations and accidental loads. So for some buildings, we will have identifiable accidental forces. They might be things like car impact or lorry impact or an industrial process that could cause an explosion. In those situations, we need to identify those accident, uh, accidental loads and design for them. Um, BSEN 1991 uh, includes uh, all the loads you might need for this kind of accident. Ideally, we would remove these potential accidental forces, but obviously if a building has been built to house an industrial process, removing that industrial process wouldn't be hugely useful. But then we also have unidentifiable, under, unidentifiable accidental forces. So this is the really strange thing about um, disproportionate collapse is that if we don't have a, a known accidental force, we, we still have to design for a baseline risk level. Now, the baseline risk level is effectively if we follow the codes, if we do the right thing by the codes in an intelligent way, we have covered that baseline risk level. But I also want to introduce the concept of soft risks. And I think this is this is one of the biggest challenges for construction is construction is a people business, uh, which is partly what makes it so interesting. Um, and if a building project is successful and the outcome is safe, it will be because people have the right skills that they've been able to collaborate, they've been able to communicate and they know what their responsibilities are. And this is another big thing when it comes to buildings where different consultants have been involved with different elements of design, who actually is responsible for the robustness strategy of that building? Are there gaps in design? Is no one responsible? So I think these soft risks are very significant. And actually that's the same for most of life. Things go wrong if people aren't doing the right thing and working together. 
So this table is derived from BSEN 1991-17, and it basically talks about these two strategies I've just covered. So one, looking at identifiable accidental actions and designing for them or removing those potential actions. And the second strategy is, is this more nebulous, we're designing for this baseline list, risk. If we do this, and in this case, it's these three approaches, approach one, two, and three, our building will be robust. And then if there's an unknown accidental load, well, known at the time of it happening, but unknown in terms of design, the building should be able to cope and not fail disproportionately. So when we talk about approach one prescriptive rules, these are those vertical and horizontal ties that we put into buildings, either as part that, that are either implicit in the structure anyway, or as an addition to that building. Approach two in the Eurocode is called alternative load path, and we might think about that as notional element removal. And then the third approach is we design for this for a notional load of 34 kilonewtons per square meter. So this is our effectively our baseline accidental load. Okay, I've summed it up there, so I won't go over it again. So these three approaches aren't always applicable to each building class, and they're not always possible to achieve with different building materials. This is directly from approved document A, and we can see that what I've just covered is set out clearly again in approved document A. So there's no excuse for us to not know what we're expected to do. And again, here is that collapse diagram. What, what can we allow to collapse if we can't protect the building completely from collapse? So approach one is tying horizontal ties and vertical ties. And for consequence, class 2A, sometimes effective anchorage is OK. Um, and this is generally applicable in masonry and timber buildings. In steel and concrete buildings, it is very easy to get those horizontal ties in as part of in, in concrete column to beam connections, slab to beam connections, and in steel beam to, to steel, um, beam to column connections. There's a lot of strength in a steel or RC concrete connection. And so the, the um, analogy that is often given is a house of cards. Now, theoretically, a house of cards is a structure. It can transfer um, vertical loads to the ground or the table, but it has absolutely no uh, robustness because it's not tied together. But approach one is generally chosen for steel and concrete frame buildings. It's relatively easy to implement. We need to be careful. A steel or concrete building may have a transfer structure, often a podium deck. There might be more openings than we anticipate. And you need to think about what to do around the stair core. And in the newly published guidance, there's a, a very good example in the precast concrete chapter about how to deal with a stair core. Approach to this notional element removal. So we imagine a scenario like a column or a length of wall being removed because of this accidental event. And then after each of those removal, removals, we check that the building can remain stable or that collapses within that limit we've covered before. And this approach is often used for timber frame and masonry buildings. Masonry, traditional masonry buildings have a cellular layout, generally have a cellular layout. And you can, and we know that masonry can arch over gaps. Now, uh, in this case, this isn't, isn't actually um, masonry arching over an accidentally removed wall. This is actually masonry arching over a beam that potentially isn't stiff enough over a large shop front opening. But on the assumption your picture is okay, we can see that the masonry has effectively arched because we can see that these horizontal and vertical cracks through the wall. And in fact, this whole street, which is actually the street I live in, every single shop has these triangular um, crack patterns over every single shop window. Okay, so just to reinforce that. But uh, a, class, a consequence class 2A and class consequence class 1 building, masonry building, if we're thinking about things like um, single house dwellings, conventional construction, um, the robustness requirements are generally just satisfied by building a normal building. 
it's when we we just need to be careful that norm because normal buildings are becoming less and less normal and those of you who work on residential properties may have discovered your clients don't really like walls anymore and would much prefer to have open plan spaces and then this approach is very often used for platform timber frame design as well and within the the new guidance we have examples on doing a notional element removal check in a timber platform frame building. Okay, this diagram again, I obviously liked it, but if you can't cope with the damage, we are allowed some collapse, that 15% or 100 square metres. That 15% is interesting though, because it means there are some layouts where you can never fulfil that 15%, you can never be under it. And that really depends on things like the column spacing and floor span length you might actually be in a position where you cannot limit, if you remove a column, just by dint of its geometry, you can't limit to 15%. And this statement is made in both BSE and 9117 and approved document A. And a point to be made is that the floor below probably should be able to support that debris from the floor above. And we do cover debris loading um, in the new guidance. Okay, so let's go back to Ivy Hodge and her cup of tea. We don't actually know whether she drank that cup of tea or not. I suspect she didn't. But the interesting thing is that accidental load, that baseline accidental load we might use if we don't know of another accident has been derived from her kettle and it was based on um, a dent in her kettle um, from which was back calculated. The, the pressure that might have caused that dent. What we don't know whether is whether Ivy Hodge took the kettle to her new flat. Okay, so approach three is we do key element design and we make the elements strong enough to resist the large load. And again, as a design engineer, you need to make a sensible decision as to what kind of area you're going to apply that load from. Um, again, we've covered a discussion on that within the new guidance. Now, approach three is particularly key when you have these significant and important structures such as transfer structures um, and cantilevers. So for, for, for a starter with a transfer structure, you might not be able to get horizontal and vertical ties continuously from the roof to the foundation. And a transfer structure is likely to support a larger area of the building. So if there were to be a problem with that transfer structure, whether the transfer beam itself or a column supporting that transfer beam collapse would be more significant. And the same applies to cantilevering structures. A cantilevering structure may support a significant amount of the building above, and it also has a lot less redundancy than a beam. So a, be a beam will have at least two supports and it may have um, be continuous over a support, whereas a cantilever just has one support hence it's a cantilever. Okay, so this illustration here, if you picture the, the transfer structure, which is the podium deck, you can imagine that if part of that podium deck were to collapse, it would probably bring down a lot more columns and a lot more debris than say, if there were a collapse of a column higher up on the left-hand corner of the building. And this slide sort of summarizes the approaches you might take. So here we've got, this is actually um, a cartoon version of a, of a real building. Um, luckily for the people who designed it, I can't remember which building it was. I, I was checking the design. So this building used two, both strategies and various elements of design, uh, of various approaches. So it was near to a railway line. And so they moved the, the two lowest floors of the building back from the, the railway line so that if the train derailed, it wouldn't hit the building. Then to achieve this, they designed um, the, a um, they designed a cantilevering structure. It was a trust cantilever, effectively, to cantilever over that um, that ground floor. And then they designed that as a key element. And then above that, once the floor plan became regular, um, they switched to to, to designing for horizontal and vertical ties. So this building design looked at both strategies and two approaches. So as a design structural engineer, what do we need to do? Well, 
I would suggest that we start by describing the structure and the materials of the building and we explain its layout and the loading to whoever's going to check it. We then identify specific risks to the building, such as vehicle impact. We then identify the areas that are particularly important, like transfer beams or cantilevers. We determine whether the structure has a robust element, a uh, layout, and identify if load-bearing elements line through or not. And if they don't, we have to think carefully about where we go next. We then decide upon our approach, whether it's approach one, two, or three to make the structure is robust. And then once we've done all that, we go back through and we check that that approach is appropriate and that we're not doing this as just a maths exercise. We're doing it because we think this is what the building is best for the building. So I'm going to briefly come on to adding additional stories. Vertical extensions, we sometimes call them, or airspace development, and they're a high risk activity. We're basically putting a construction site at a high level. So what do we need to think about? Well, we need to think about vertical load transfer. We're putting higher loads on the foundations just to the, due to the weight and its associated imposed loads onto the foundations and the existing walls. But we also increase the loading due to wind loading. Um, and this is something that I find engineers often miss actually. And then we need to think about the disproportionate collapse strategy. Now it's very common when people are looking at adding extra stories that we start with a masonry building and we start with a consequence class 2A building, which might not actually conform to modern building regulations anyway, but by turning it into a five-storey building, it moves up a consequence class into CC2B. And, and this, this requirement to check a building for the modern expectations of a CC2B building are much more onerous and a challenge with masonry buildings. So that's what I'm going to focus on here. We also need to think about the neighbour. Um, so the, uh, the building regulations actually mention the neighbour briefly in A1B. We are told we cannot impair the stability of any part of another building. But we've also got the statutory, in addition to that statute, we've got the legislation of the Party Wall Act as well. So there are risks. And the risks are harder if the building's occupied. There's less opportunity to do investigation. There's also less opportunity to actually do any um, strengthening works if they're required. But also in an existing building, there might be previous um, alterations and strengthening works that we may not understand properly. But we do need to understand them if we're doing any major works. A building also may be in poor condition and it may be at the end of its design life. Now, as engineers, we design for 50 year design lives, but we're often working on buildings that are several hundred years old. And the building may already be highly stressed. So approved document A doesn't say anything about alterations, but the building regulations do in that it talks about material change of use, material alterations um, and, and what triggers building work. And I would really suggest that people read clauses three to six in the building regulations. We've in within the guidance, we've got a very helpful flow chart on how to um, decide whether your your altered building needs to conform with the building regulations or whether it needs to not be worse than it was before. So what should we think about? What should the disproportionate uh, and robustness strategy be? Well, when it comes to an existing masonry building, adding ties, vertical and horizontal ties, is in itself a high risk activity and might discount the innate robustness that's already there. So we have the opportunity to use other approaches such as element removal or, or, um, risk, or, or risk assessment. And the risk assessment approach is discussed um, in the iStructee's book on um, consequence class three buildings, high risk buildings. And I'm going to briefly mention it now, but you'll be glad to know I've almost finished. But I think that when it comes to existing buildings, as engineers, we're going to have to get from very familiar with thinking about structural performance. How does the building actually perform? How will the building perform if there's an accidental event? And what might inform our understanding of structural performance is by doing risk assessment and also looking at ALARP. Um, 
ALAP is a phrase that we're going to get used to when if you're out there doing assessments of ex, um, higher risk buildings for the building safety regulator, ALAP is as low as reasonably practical. OK, so coming on to structural performance, how do we expect it to perform if there's an accidental event? Risk assessment, what should we be doing? What are the hazards? We need to identify those hazards and then how they can be mitigated. And then what are the consequences of those hazards if we don't mitigate them? And then the ALARP principles, and I'd encourage you to read the HSE framework, has this triangle. So at the bottom, we have broadly acceptable risk. What can we tolerate? At the top, that we can, are risks that cannot be justified. But there's a middle zone where we can tolerate a risk if we do, if it is impractical to do that further risk reduction. And, and the ALAP principles are, are not something I'm going to go to go go into in any greater depth tonight. Um, back to BSE and 1991-17, they have a, um, a flow chart in Annex B on how you might do a risk assessment. And this is also an extract of BSE in 1991-17 in that they identify um, consequences and the significance of a consequence from very low to severe. And if you delve into the code a bit more, you'll see that low to high uh, match up with the consequence classes. So a CC1 building would be low, CC3 would be high, and medium would cover 2A and 2B. It's a really good read, BS Ian 1991-17. And again, they give an example of how we might do a risk assessment. We think about um, a risk, we think about its consequence, and we think about a probability of that risk occurring. Okay, so you'll be glad to know I've almost finished. So other resources. So if you're working on an existing building, I suggest, well, I mean, you should buy the book that we're talking about tonight, but I suggest you also buy the Manual for the Risk Assessment of High Risk Structures, because that also has a whole chapter about existing buildings, and it talks about the risk assessment approach. Then Sean introduced this to me, ISO 13822. I think um, we, we often don't delve into the international standards, but this has a really clear um, methodology for assessing existing structures as does BRE 366. That's also a really good read for assessing and appraising an existing building that might be one that you're altering or doing a vertical extension to. And then finally, I think one of my favorite reads was a document that's free online that was put together um, by the Communities and Local Government and the Center for the Protection of National Infrastructure, but it was written by Arab and it basically um, covers everything that you need to know on robustness and is still in date, even though it's going on for eight years old, I think. OK, so these are your resources. Obviously, um, the book that's been newly published, you definitely need to be reading the Eurocodes, then the appropriate material, Eurocode um, and its national annex. And then finally, I think this is finally a competent design team clear responsibilities and appropriate checking. Okay, so I'm going to go over to Alistair, who um, is going to talk about um, building failures. Right, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming to this presentation. Um, it's a great book, Ruth, and you are to be congratulated for the enormous amount of work you've put into it. And the work that you have built on, which was originated by Alan Mann. And thanks also go to the other contributors who've made this such a valuable work. Now, the objective of having a robust building is to prevent failures, be they great or small, to protect the public, the rescue services who may be involved, and those in the construction. And the consequences of any collapse can be profound and in some cases can be quite awful. There may be casualties and fatalities. There will be collateral damage, which could last for years. 
And the careers and personal well-being of all those involved, including designers and instructors, will be affected. The Grenfell inquiry shows the extent and depth of how these consequences impact not only for those directly caught up in the tragedy, but for whole communities, and ultimately the culture of safety for our homes and the attitudes and responsibilities of the industry and indeed of government. So with that salutary warning and a reminder that most buildings are constructed in an extremely safe and reliable manner, we're going to now look at some extreme collapses to show what has gone wrong in recent years. And these are just samples. There are plenty of others which are worse. And in all cases, robustness or the lack of it has played a part. Now at Cross, we collect information from confidential reports and from events in the public domain to maintain a continuing review of safety matters. And here's the ethos under which we operate. It's in no particular order, but they set out the background of what we try and do. And some of the collapses we're now going to look at are from cross files and others are from media reports. Now, if you set up an internet search and look for news reports on collapses, every day you'll see somewhere in the world buildings collapse. And every day, there are major fires, but we can improve the situation by learning from our collective experiences. And here, as Ruth mentioned, is one of the most extreme events of all. Uh, this is the Rana Plaza collapse, which resulted in 1,100 deaths and twice that number of people injured. And it's the biggest collapse fatality uh, rate for a building which was not associated with a, a huge natural disaster such as an earthquake or a terrorist activity or war. It was eight stories high, the construction was substandard, there were unauthorized floors put on the top and there was heavy vibrating machinery high up in the building. So a perfect recipe for a perfect storm. And although complete collapses are relatively rare, it doesn't mean they can be discounted. It is the risk which has to be assessed, which is a combination of probability and consequence. So low probability, high consequence events must be very much on our safety radar. Nigeria is a country which has got an unfortunate reputation for many collapses. In 2022, there were 61 of them. Um, this is an example of a pancake building, uh, miraculously with very few casualties. And of course, we don't often find out the causes for these, um, but there is obviously something going very wrong in parts of their construction industry. Another country where collapses are not uncommon is India, sometimes of older buildings, but in other cases of newer buildings. And of course, in India, there is a currently a major safety issue where uh, there is a battle going on to rescue 40 miners trapped in a collapsed tunnel. Moving further around the world, this goes to Holland. And this is the uh, 20 Stadium, a, a well-known football club in Holland, where part of a cantilever roof structure collapsed uh, in no small part due to a lack of temporary bracing on the back of the structures, which you can just see there. So a failure during construction, which is not uncommon. And here, going further around the world again, but only into France, and find a pointer. Um, this is Charles de Gaulle Airport, where there was a fairly recently built tunnel. And the tunnel at this particular juncture uh, had a branch going off it, so there was a complex array of, of tunnels going in two directions. The structure was of reinforced concrete shells, uh, and the shells were reinforced on the outside by a kind of exoskeleton made of steel. You can see it in the background there. You can see the remnants of it here as well. And in fact, the failure was due to the punching shear of connections from the ex 
exoskeleton through the concrete shell. Uh, so this was something to be aware of. Uh, um, as Ruth was saying, stick to simple buildings. But if you've got a very complex building, such as this one, then you need to be particularly careful. Another example from the book uh, is Delta University. And this is put in because it's a, a fire situation. Um, and whilst buildings are often robust, concrete buildings, particularly under fire, this one wasn't. And there was a partial collapse as a consequence of a lengthy fire. And now coming back to two other buildings, which, which Ruth has mentioned, uh, the two seminal events which have changed the way we think. Ronan Point has affected the way we consider structural robustness and Grenfell, the way in which we consider fire robustness, amongst other things. Now, both were in London, which is a serious reflection on our attitude to safety and the way in which the government and industry has reacted to housing pressures over the years. Now, Ronan Point was a large planned structure. Other examples have recently been in the news, and there are likely to be more as a legacy of decisions made in the 1940s and 19, oh, sorry, 1950s and 1960s. There were multiple reasons for the Grenfell fire and the number of fatalities, uh, and construction issues were fundamental. But the robustness of the concrete frame was enough to withstand the very severe effects of a very lengthy fire. Here's another example from London. This is a steel frame building shown on the left here under construction. The ground floor had to be open because it was for assembly purposes. So the upper floors were supported by a single very large girder, story height girder, supported at the roof. So there were tension connections holding a lot of this structure up. And 15 days after that photograph was taken, the whole thing collapsed and it was a near miss because it happened just after 40 operatives had left the site. Um, the tension elements somewhere in here were a key to the issues, but it is often the case where a near miss shows a very close relationship between luck and timing. Another series of recent collapses which we have been involved with and which of course have hit the headlines in a big way is RAC which has affected schools, hospitals, and other buildings in the government estate. And it's an excellent example of, of cross at work. Uh, we had an initial report. Um, we published an alert, which produced further reports, which resulted in ISTRAC-D setting up a working party, and hence greater awareness and the discovery of so many buildings with RAAC at, of course, a huge cost to the public purse. And this will go on for some considerable time. And here is a, a statement made by the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee last week about the searing indictment of a deteriorating school estate, and which we could apply also to hospitals, chilling reminders of absolute catastrophe averted through sheer luck. Another area of robustness uh, is robustness under fire. And this was a particularly bad fire uh, at Liverpool Airport, Liverpool, sorry, arena, uh, when 1400 cars were demolished in a fire which spread rapidly, both vertically and horizontally. Um, the result was that the building which stayed more or less intact, although the thinner floors suffered quite considerably, but the robustness of the frame due to the substantial sizes of the members and the way in which they were connected both vertically and horizontally resulted in the frame remaining upright, although it had to be demolished in the end. And much more recently, there's been the fire at Luton Airport, again, around 1400 vehicles uh, destroyed. In this case, a steel frame and steel frame has suffered considerable damage um, and if we had much more time, we could debate the 
the pros and cons of concrete frame car parks versus steel frame car parks. But um, the influence of heavy fires on structures is considerable and may be expected to increase, particularly in terms of car parks. And here's one from the, uh, the Cross Archives, and it's of an LPS structure being demolished. And it is an old type, an early Ronan Point type. We don't know whether the members were strengthened post Ronan Point or not, but the demolition contractor was trying to carefully take down the top part of the building it was touched with the, with the jib of a mobile device and the whole thing came down, very reminiscent of Ronan Point. And over here, we can see the very fragile relationship between the members and the elements which connect them together. Now, balconies are a fairly mundane and fairly innocuous feature of many buildings, but they are surprisingly vulnerable to collapse partly due to the nature of the cantilevers often used for their structures and sometimes due to overloading. So uh, you get balconies in older buildings which are <clears throat> decayed in some way or deteriorated. In the middle here is a wonderful example of a concrete slab which had been cantilevering out for 20 years and suddenly was one day collapsed. And as you can see the reason, all the rebar is in the bottom of the cantilever instead of obviously being in the place where it should. And over on the right was a more recent report to cross of a cantilever uh, type balcony, which was bolted along its edge and was bolted by brackets to the outer leaf only of a brick wall. So if that hadn't been spotted and if posts hadn't been put up here and there, that balcony would surely and many others within the same building would have pulled off the brickwork. And here is one which appeared in the press last week. Uh, th this is from social media, but it talked about a balcony collapse and it reached the, the BBC and other main outlets. But in fact, it wasn't a balcony collapse. It was the uh, facade elements, the edge elements, which were brick slips falling off the edge of the balcony onto the street. Serious enough, of course, but not as bad as the complete balcony collapsing. And now move on to uh, an example uh, or two in America. This is the Florida Bridge, which collapsed during construction. It was a two-story precast element between two piers. This end collapsed, um, and there were defects in the design, uh, which, which made it inevitable that there'll be serious problems. But the interesting and disturbing feature about it was that whilst this precast element was in place around this area here where the, the, the first members joined there were very very serious cracks and those cracks were observed over a period of weeks by all involved in the design the construction the checking and the roads authority and nobody thought to say these are really serious and therefore we've got to take steps to protect the public close the bridge or whatever steps were necessary so it's an important lesson to be learned here that if you see something where there are large unexplained cracks, and particularly if those cracks should extend over a period of time, then do something about it. And the second example that we have from America relates to Champlain Towers South. This uh, was a 19... Uh, 1980s building, so 40 odd years old, reinforced concrete construction. It collapsed suddenly uh, in the early hours of the morning. There were some warning signs, there had been some cracking noted, there had been some noises noted, but essentially it was uh, an instantaneous collapse. It was certainly a progressive collapse, and it was a type of in situ frame which is generic, uh, quite common, not only in America, but various other parts of the world, including the UK. Now, the investigation on, into the collapse um, is being run by NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, 
and it's the biggest investigation of a building failure that's ever been undertaken. And the leader of it is Glenn Bell, uh, and Glenn is chair of Cross US. So he won't tell us what is going on at the moment. When the results are published sometime next year, we will be in a, in a good position to disseminate the information. And I think the consequences of the findings from Glenn and his team into that building will be similar to those effects which rippled on from uh, Ronan Point and from Grenfell.